This video covers one example of the method of Frobenius for solving at regular singular points. Here is the differential equation. Zero is a singular point for this equation. If I divide through by 3 tier to clear the coefficient of y double prime, then p and q will be undefined at t equals zero. So here are those coefficient functions p and q. Is this a regular singular point? Well, each of p and q have a pole of order one at t equals zero. To be a regular singular point, p can have a pole of order one and q can have a pole of order two. So this is fine. These poles are within the tolerance for a regular singular point. So the method of Frobenius does apply here. I don't need to repeat all the setup. I can just move to the indicial equation. I need the two coefficients. Here are the functions t times p and t squared times q. The limit of t times p at t equals zero is the coefficient of p negative one, which here is one third. And the limit of t squared q at t equals zero is the coefficient q negative two, which here is zero. And knowing these two coefficients, I just write down the indicial quadratic from the formula I gave in the previous video. This particular quadratic has roots r equals zero and r equals two thirds. So from here on, I'm gonna do two different series solutions. One without any extra powers, that's the r equals zero case. And one where I multiply everything by t to the two thirds, the r equals two thirds case. Here's the first solution working with r equals zero. I go back to the original differential equation and put, it, put in a generic series and its derivatives. Here, since r equals zero, and I'm not multiplying by any extra powers of t, I do lose constant terms in the derivatives. When r equals zero, I have something that looks very much like a solution at an ordinary point. The steps are the same. I take the three t into the first series, then I shift to make all the powers of t into t to the n, which means shifting the first two series by one. Then I pull out terms to make the starting points the same. I need to pull out the first term from the second and the third series. Those are going to be c1 and negative c0. Then I can combine the series into 1. From the terms inside the series, I set them equal to 0, solve for cn plus 1, and simplify the denominator a bit to get the recurrence relation. And I remember that I also have c1 minus c0 equals 0 from the two terms that I pulled out. Then I start calculating coefficients. The recurrence relation is only first order, so there's only one unknown value here, and this generally happens with Frobenius. I expect one unknown for each value of r, and then between the two roots, I expect to get the two linearly independent solutions. The c1 minus c0 term outside the general recurrence relation gives me that c1 has to be the same as c0. And then I apply the recurrence relation to start calculating coefficients. What's the pattern here? The numerators are all just c0, and the denominators are a product, and the product is being built in two pieces. The second half is just building a factorial, but the first half is building a product of each third number. So this could be 4 times 7 times 10 times 13, and so on. With this pattern observation, this is the general form, and this form works for n equals 1 and onwards. Therefore, this is the solution I get from r equals 0. This is a nice Taylor series solution. I only get one in linearly independent solution here, and that's fine. I only expected one for each root of the indicial equation. Now I do the other solution for the other root, two thirds. This is the series I want to work with, where t to the two thirds is pulled in and added to the exponent. I work with put this and its derivatives into the series. I do not lose any terms here. Since the power is not an integer, there are no constant terms to lose to the derivatives. Here is the result with the second and first derivatives of the series in the differential equation. Then I need to work with this, which is a bit tricky. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull t to the two-thirds out of everything. This is almost always what I want to do with a non-integer exponent. It will make the rest of the series manipulation much easier. When I do that, I get these three series. Then I'll shift to match exponents as usual. I'm going to shift the last series to make all the exponents n minus 1, which means shifting it down by 1 in the term and up by 1 in the bounds. Well, then I have the same powers, but not the same starting bounds. So I'll pull out the first term in the first two series so that everything will start with n equals 1. These are the two terms I get when I pull out the terms to make the starting bounds match. 
both have c naught t to the negative 1 with these coefficients. I group the remaining pieces into one series. Then I factor cn out of these two and do some arithmetic to simplify the equation. Then I solve for cn to get the recurrence relation, again doing some algebra to try and make the relation as reasonable as possible to work with. Finally, since the convention is to have cn in the recurrence relation on the right side, I shift everything in the recurrence relation up by 1. So this is my recurrence relation. I also have the first term, which only has c0. However, the coefficients here all cancel. So this term is already 0 equals 0, and c0 still can be any arbitrary starting value. Then I use the recurrence relation to start calculating coefficients. What pattern am I getting? The numerator is just c0. The denominator is like the previous solution. I'm building a factorial in the second half of the denominator, and the pattern of multiplying every third number starting with 5 in the first part. That leads to this expression for the coefficient. I put this into the series for the second solution, y2. Notice the power. In this solution, I multiply by t to the 2 thirds. So this is not a Taylor series, but a small adjustment of a Taylor series by another power. These are the two solutions, so the general solution is a linear combination of these two. These are almost certainly not elementary functions. Again, series solution tends to find new functions to solve DEs, functions that I couldn't have found without this technique, and that's one of the major strengths of doing solutions 